Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session looking at the English Traveller uh, written by Thomas Haywood. Uh, it was performed at the cockpit in Drury Lane in around 1624, maybe tw late 23, uh, probably by uh, Lady Elizabeth's men, uh, we can infer because of the venue. Um, and uh, yes, it's it's a, it's a relatively late play for the plays we've been doing of late. Um, we've been mostly sticking to the beginning of the 17th century, but we thought, just jump forward 20 years. Why not? It's a laugh. Um, I am not your host. I am your introducey person, Robert Crichton, um, uh, leading you into this, this wonderful room of people. I will then abandon you all uh, to your fate, uh, as I will hand over to Sarah Blake, who will do the hosting duties uh, for this uh, particular session. So to find out what's going on with the English traveller, uh, we have in the room a reading the prologue and Wincott is... Hi, I'm Eric. I'm here caffeinating slowly excellent uh reading young geraldine and uh, reynold is hello i'm lynn freitas i'm a college composition teacher i'm coming to you from the northwestern united states reading wife and young lionel is my leaky chapel occasionally actor more frequently translator based in the north of england uh, reading Clown and Rioter is... Taking a sip. My timing is, as ever, impeccable. <laughs> Dave Longstaff, nothing very much. Northwest of England. Uh, reading Robin and Scaffa is... Callum in Suffolk. Uh, some of these, some of these, there, there are some interesting questions. Precisely where to put the uh, the emphasis on names, and uh, and uh, so uh, pronunciations may vary. Reading uh, Prudentilla and Blanda is uh, Bland Lois Potter in uh, London, and uh, reading uh, Dalaville is. Hello, I'm Francis Cox, an actor living in Amsterdam. And thus, I will hand over to uh, the host who will keep this session going uh, uh, through Act 1 into the beginning of Act 2, handing over to Sarah. And I will now vanish from your screen. Thank you very much, Rob. And just like that, he disappears. Right, let's kick off with the prologue. Yes, I have to find it first. Um, <clears throat> a strange play you are like to have. For no, we use no drum, nor trumpet, nor dumb show, no combat marriage, nor so much today, as song, dance, mask, to bomb ass out of play. Yet all these all good and still in frequent use with our best poets. Nor is this excuse made by our author as if want of skill caused this defect. It's rather his self-will. Will you the reason know? There have so many men in that kind that he desires not at any at this time in his scene. No help, no strain or flash that's borrowed from another's brain. Nor speaks he this that he would have you fear it. Only he tries, he, he only tries if once bare lines will bear it. Yet may it afford, so please you silent set some mirth, some matter and perhaps some wit. And we go straight into Act 1, Scene 1. Enter young Geraldine and Master Dallaville. O oh, friend, that I to mine own notion had, jo had joined but your experience. I have the theoric, but you the practic. Then I think that's you, young Geraldine. Muted. Sorry. I perhaps have seen what you have only heard of. Read of. There's your happiness. A scholar in his study knows the stars, their motion and their influence, which are fixed and which are wandering, can decipher seas and give each several land his proper bounds. But set him to the compass, he's to seek when a plain pilot can direct his course from hence unto both the Indies, can bring back his ship and charge with prophets quintuple. I have read Jerusalem and studied Rome, can tell in what degree each city stands, describe the distance of this place from that, 
All this the scale in every map can teach. Nay, for a need could punctually recite the monuments in either. But what I have by relation only, knowledge by travel, which still makes up a complete gentleman, proves eminent in you. Now I must confess I have seen Jerusalem and Rome have brought mark from the one, from the other, testimony. From Spain and France and from their heirs have sucked breath of every language. But no more of this discourse since we draw near the place of them we go to visit. And enter clown. Noble Master Geraldine, Worshipful Master Dalaville. I see thou still rememberst us. Remember you? I have so many memorandums from the multiplicities of your bounties that not to remember you or to forget myself. You are both most ingeniously and nobly welcome. And why ingeniously and nobly? Well, because I've given your welcomes other attributes than I have done, the one being a soldier, the other seeming a scholar, I should have <laughs> lied in the first and showed myself a kind of blockhead in the last. I see your wit is nimble as your tongue, but how doth all at home? Uh, small doings at home, sir. In regard that, the age of my master corresponds not with the youth of my mistress. You know, cold January and lusty May seldom meet in conjunction. I do not think but this fellow in time may, for his wit and understanding, make almanacs. <laughs> not so, sir. You, being more judicious than I, I'll give you the preeminence in that, because I see, by proof, you have such judgment in times and seasons. And why in times and seasons? Well, because you have so seasonably made choice to come just so at dinner time. You're welcome, gentlemen. I'll go tell my master of your coming. A pleasant knave. This fellow, I perceive, is well acquainted with his master's mind. Oh, tis a good old man. And she a lady, for beauty and for virtue unparalleled. Nor can you name that thing to grace a woman she has not in full perfection. Though in their years they might seem disparity, and therefore, at the first, a match unfit. Imagine but his age and government, with all her modesty and chaste respect. Betwixt them, there's so sweet a sympathy as crowns a noble marriage. Tis acknowledged, but to the worthy gentleman himself, I am so bound in many courtesies that, not the least, by all the expression my labour or my industry can show, I will know how to cancel. Oh, you are modest. He studies to engross him to me to himself and is so wedded to my company, he makes me stranger to my father's house, although so near a neighbour. This approves you to be most nobly propertied that from one so exquisite in judgment can attract so affectionate an eye. Your character I must bestow on his unmerited love, the one that... I know I, as one that I know, I have it, and yet ignorant which way I should deserve it. Here comes both. Uh, but before both come, let's just pause there and take in what we've uh, had to look at already. So, young Geraldine, bit of a traveller, obviously. Dalaville, also a bit of a traveller. Besties, would you say? There's a bit of a, bit of a bromance mm. going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lynn. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they definitely admire each other. I kind of wanted to go back and just sort of um, flag up or just like acknowledge the prologue. There's some interesting stuff on there, hints about actual theatrical practice in the period that I found interesting. Mm. Um, trumpets and drums, oh, we're not imitating anybody else. You can kind of make a good guess that those were things that um, audiences were used to seeing. So that was just as someone who's interested in the history of the drama in this period, it was interesting little details. Mm, yeah, very much so. Alan. I must admit, I, <clears throat> the way it came across to me that Dalaville has traveled well within the library. 
Yeah. He hasn't actually gone very far, yeah. he, but he's he's read all, he's read all the books. Yeah. He's read the instructions. He just <laughs> hasn't been anywhere. Yeah, he certainly seems to admire the fact that young mm. Geraldine has been to these places, doesn't mm. he? Yeah, mm. Eric. I just enjoyed sort of going back to the prologue that it's basically like, we didn't have a budget, okay? Um, <laughs> but, you know, kind of like glossing over the fact that like, yes, we were trying to do a stripped back version of this, um, which is kind of very nice and sort of, and also the last sort of two couplets, which is like, um, please sit down and enjoy the film or yeah. you know, <laughs> switch off your mobile phones. Um, also, I liked the comment about, um, what was it? I think it was... Um, cold January and lusty May just like the contrast there is quite a, like it already sets you up for like the situation uh, without actually meeting the characters yes although of course we don't know what that situation is yet Eric because we haven't quite got that far yet <laughs> uh, Lynn and then yeah we have to... conflicting reports the clowns making kind of making jokes about the fact that uh, there's there's a significant age gap you know that my master's age suits not isn't it suits is the, is the word he uses um but the the young gentleman seemed quite insistent that um she she's a lovely virtuous person they're actually quite happy together mm -hmm. or th so they seem to they, they insist that the marriage is actually a, a successful one so it remains to be seen yes i mean it, it you you have to think those of us who are like have read too many plays for our own good will be like oh yes we can see what's happening here otherwise he wouldn't have mentioned it but yes to all intents and purposes it seems to be where we are told that it's a, a good relationship uh Stephen uh yeah just following on from that I'm just really intrigued by uh May and January because we we would usually say May and December wouldn't we Mm. Yeah, um, it's true. We would. And uh, so, I mean, with that, I guess we've got that sort of chronological thing. As in December is, you know, you're you're about finished. Uh, so I just find that really intriguing mm. uh, as a contrast because it, when it, May and December, I think, oh, December, yeah, it's after the autumn. Whereas this is a much more kind of um, <laughs> frigid <laughs> metaphor, <laughs> really. Um, I was just intrigued by that. Um, and the other thing was that, you know, the clown. They they're basically feeding him I mean it's it's a kind of you know he, he does that clown thing of sort of setting setting up a sort of Socratic gag where he'll say something and this sort of you know Greek philosophy idiot will go oh what do you mean by that and then you know <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. what I mean by that is you're an idiot um, <laughs> and, and so we've got that kind of a, a level there we don't know how apart from the virtuosity of whoever's doing the clown which I guess is part of the point uh, we don't know how that works with the plot at all because it's it, it seems kind of disconnected from anything really mm. you know they, they aren't necessarily uh, well the way i feel about it and and the plot will probably prove me wrong they're not necessarily stupid or anything like that he's just uh, the clan is just like showing off um showing off verbally with this kind of you know the memorandums from the multiplicities of your bounties yeah um, <laughs> but but also showing off that you know it's kind of like slate of hand you know, um, you know, he's he's just conjuring stuff mm. for them. Yes, yes, he's not particularly gulling them. He's just sort of, yeah, entertaining. High spirits. Them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lewis. Yeah, I don't know whether at this stage Haywood is still playing clown roles or not, but I mean, he did originally, so uh, he probably was used to writing sort of show pieces for clowns. But I wanted to make a point about the may january thing i think this is again chaucer i'm sorry i was talking about chaucer last week but the merchant's tale is about somebody named january who is an old man and marries a young girl called may uh so i think <laughs> they're they're the names i think have become kind of proverbial for uh old man young woman i'd forgotten about that but yes g going deep back into the recesses of my memory mm. I have, a, I have a vague recollection of, of old January. Um, never mind, that's beside the point. Eric. Uh, I, I was going to say, I was going to mention sort of, because we had, uh, I think it was um, in the last Will and Testament of Will Summer or something, where uh, we had um, sort of, you know, it, it was meant to be like an external cr clown commenting on stuff, uh, but also part of the action. And uh, what I found like with January and May, we had that sort of contrast between spring and winter and then back winter 
which was like another element, sort of like winter and then deep winter. And then, yeah. I, I don't know, it just sort of, that, that's kind of what I assumed when uh, that was read. Yeah, by the time you've got to January, it's, it's mm. yeah, it's, it's all it's all pretty much, there's no, there's no more downhill from there. It's just, you're at the bottom of a hill. <laughs> huh. Right, okay. Uh, shall we press on then? Because we're still in the middle of scene one. So enter old Mr. Wincott, wife, uh, Prudentilla, the sister. Gentlemen, welcome, but what need I use a word so common unto such whom my house was never private? I expect you should not look for such a needless phrase, especially you, Master Geraldine. Your father is my neighbor, and I know you ever from even from the cradle. And then I loved your infancy, and since your riper growth bettered by travel, my wife and you in youth were playfellows, and nor now be strangers as I take it, nor above not above two years different in your age. So much hath he outstripped me. I would have you think this your home, free is your father's house, and to command it as the master on it. Go call boldly here and entertain your friends as in your own possessions. When I see it, I'll say you love me truly. Not till then. Oh, what a happiness your father hath. Far above me, one to inherit after him, where I have no some childless. That defect heaven hath supplied in this your virtuous wife, both fair and full of accomplishments. My father is a widower, and herein your happiness transcends him. O oh, Master Geraldine, flattery in men's an adjunct of their sex. This country breeds it, and for that, so far you need not to have traveled. <laughs> Truth's a word that should in every language relish well, nor have I that exceeded. Sir, my husband hath took much pleasure in your strange discourse about Jerusalem and the Holy Land, how the new city differs from the old, what ruins of the temple yet remain, and whether Zion and those hills about, with these adjacent towns and villages, keep that proportion distance as we read. And then in Rome of that great Pyramus, reared in the front, on four lions mounted, how many of those idle temples stand first, dedicated to their heathen gods, which ruined, which to better use repaired of their pantheon and their capital, what structures are demolished, what remains. And what more pleasure to an old man's ear that never drew, save his own country's heir. Then hear such things related. I do exceed him in years, I must confess, yet he much older than I in his experience. Uh, Master Geraldine, may I be bold to ask you but one question, the which I'd be resolved in? Anything that lies within my knowledge? Put him to it. Do, sister, you shall find him, make no doubt, most pregnant in his answer. Uh, in your travels through France, through Savoy and through Italy, Spain and the Empire, Greece and Palestine, which breeds the choicest beauties? In truth, lady, I never cast on any in those parts a curious eye of censure, since my travel was only aimed at language, and to know these passed me but a common object as common objects did, seen but not much regarded. Oh, you strive to express a most unheard of modesty and that's seldom found in any traveler, especially of our country, thereby seeking to make yourself peculiar. I should be loath, prof I should be loath to profess in outward show to be one man and prove myself another. Uh, one thing more, were you to marry, you that know these climes, their states and their conditions, out of which of all these countries would you choose your wife? I'll answer you in brief, as I observe each several climb for object, fair or use, affords within itself for all of these what is most pleasing to the man there born. Spain, that yields scant of food, affords the nation a parsimonious stomach, where your appetites are not content but with large excess of the full table. Where, where the pleasingest fruits are found most frequent, 
there they best content. Where plenty flows, it asks abundant feasts. For so hath provident nature dealt with all. So in the choice of women, the Greek wantons compelled beneath the Tur Turkish slavery vassal themselves to all men and such best please the voluptuous that delight in change. The French is of one humor, Spain another, the hot Italian, he's estranged from both, all pleased with their own nations, even the more he thinks the blackest the most beautiful. And lady, since you so far tax my choice, idle, I'll thus resolve you, being an Englishman, amongst all these nations I have seen or tried to please me best here. I would choose my bride. And happy were that lady in my thoughts, whom you did deign that grace to. How now, sister? This is a fashion that's but length come up for maids to court their husbands. I would wife it were no worse, upon condition they had my helping hand and purse to boot, with both in ample measure. Oh, this gentleman I love, nay, almost dote on. You have my leave to give it full expression. In these arms, then, oh, had my youth been blessed with such a son to have made my estate to my name hereditary, I should have gone contented to my grave as to my bed, to death as to my sleep, and heaven hath, uh, but heaven hath, will in all things, once more welcome in you, sir, for your friend's sake. Would I had in me that which he hath, to have claimed it for my own. However, I much thank you. And enter the clown again. Now, sir, the news with you. The <coughs> news, sir. Well, the meat stands piping hot upon the dresser. The kitchen's in a heat, and the cook hath so bestirred himself that he's in a sweat. The jack plays music, and the spits turn round to it. This fellow's my best clock. He still strikes true to dinner. And to supper too, sir. I know not how the day goes with you, but my stomach hath struck twelve. I can assure you of that. You take us unprovided, gentlemen, yet something you shall find, and we would rather give you the, the entertain of household guests than compliment of strangers. I pray, enter. And they all exit uh, apart from the clown. I'll stand to it, that in good hospitality there can be nothing found that's ill. He, that's a good housekeeper, keeps a good table. A good table is never without good stools, Good stools, seldom without good guests. Good guests, never without good cheer. Good cheer cannot be without good stomachs. Good stomachs without good digestion. Good digestion keeps men in good health. And therefore, all good people that bear good minds, as you love goodness, be sure to keep good meat and drink in your house, and so you shall be called good men, and nothing can come on it but good. I warrant you. <laughs> and the clown exits. <laughs> and that's the end of the first scene of the play. Oh, that was a splendid little... <laughs> monologue there. How, how did you find that Stephen you seem to be enjoying it uh yeah I didn't know where it was going you know I, so, <laughs> I, I hadn't read it so um it, it, it sort of occurred to me that it was um it was a kind of Gilbert and Sullivan patter song <laughs> about halfway through yeah. Yeah. so I kind of speeded up with it um but it, it's it's kind of like um yeah, it's it's. I can't remember though. There's, there's a song, isn't there? It says this connects to this, it connects to this, connects to this, connects to this. And part of it is the it's the kind of fireworks where you're playing sort of x degrees of separation. <laughs> you know, so wh where is he going with this chain? Uh, which is which is quite fun. And I suppose the speeding up helps with that because you kind of you get a sort of vertiginous, you know, vertigo and and virtuosity um, as well. Uh, it's also the kind of standard thing for clowns, isn't it? Which is like, um, you know, it, uh, the clown is there for Maslow's hierarchy, you know, uh, predominantly <laughs> predominantly the food and drink stuff, you know, yeah. food, yeah. drink, warmth, uh, you know, the occasional bit of sex if you can come across it. And, and yes, basically the clown is living the best life, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, um, just get that impression. He's definitely one of the, yeah. He is not like one of these clowns that we've seen who are sort of beaten and ragged and no, he's... Yeah. he's it's it's he's benevolent as well. It's kind of mm. like addressing the audience. It's, it's hospitality again, isn't it? It's mm. such, such a big thing, you know, in, in the kind of the way that early modern society is set up. Hospitality is, is the welfare state almost, you know. Mm -hmm. So he, he's, he's, it's kind of a, you know, praising the NHS level of 
you know, yeah. get you on side, yeah. sort of. Do you know what I mean? To yes. get you on side. Yes, yes, he'd be out there with his saucepan. <laughs> <laughs> um, L- Lois, did I see your hand? Uh, no. No. no? <laughs> Lynn, I've definitely seen yours. Yeah. There is a kind of, of, of generosity and benevolence to the whole text so far. You know, the, the, the prologue is really very modest and self-effacing. The two young men are just are, are, are being very courteous and, and admiring of one another. And, and the, you know, there's all this, this politeness uh, between the host and his guests. Oh, if only you were my son. Um, oh, you know, your father is luckier, is, is more fortunate, happiness being more equated with fortune than with mood. So your father's fortunate to have you as a son. Oh, but you're so fortunate to have this lovely young wife and you might still have children. Um, it's all very much no, no after you, no after you, <laughs> kind of, kind of thing. And even even the clown, they say, oh, he's pretty funny. They, you know, that the, the clown isn't offensive. He's not grating on people. They say, oh, he's 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 pretty he's pretty cute. He's pretty entertaining. So I, mean, I don't know if that mood is going to be sustained or if it's all just gonna go south. Well, as 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 we know. Plays are always so harmonious. Everybody always gets on well the whole time. And I can't see this going south at all. <laughs> Francis. <laughs> yeah, um, following on from what Lynn just said, I, I was thinking, you know, we're already a ways into this play and we're still not sure where it's going. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and as Lynn says, everything, everybody's been very good natured and affable. And there are all these possibilities, uh, prud- uh, prud- uh, What's the name? Prudenta, <laughs> Prudentula, Prudentula, I think. Maybe coming on to young Geraldine. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's this, uh, there's this idea <sighs> that um, Wincott's wife is too young for him, and so that that's a sort of pregnant situation. Um, so yeah, there are all these, all these questions. Everything's still very much up in the air. I'm, I'm kind of waiting for the serpent in the garden. Yes, yes, indeed. There was, a, was there maybe a slight rustling in the bushes with um, with the the information that we got that um, young Geraldine and the wife were childhood yes. friends? Yes, yes. So, yeah, and there's only yeah. a couple, they make... Um, somebody makes the point of saying that there's only a couple of years between them. I think it's the husband, actually, isn't it? But he seems he seems totally fine with that. So yeah, yeah. what could what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Eric, I, I was just going to comment on like the well, aside from you know what could possibly go wrong. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I was just going to I like the comment about like this fellow's my best clock. He still strikes true mm. to dinner. <laughs> it's just yeah, like great. yes, this is perfect timing. We have to go eat now. Yeah. Yeah, we've had some really, um, yeah, some um, virtuoso stuff from the clown. But as um, as Lynn was saying, and Francis, it's it's kind of all it's all very civilized, isn't it? It's all kind of very amusing and light and warm and civilized. So, yeah, <laughs> let's let's carry on, shall we, and see what happens to this lovely, warm, civilized society that we've been dropped into like a hot bath. Okay, uh, Act One, Scene Two: Enter two serving men, Raynal and Robin. Away, you Corridon! Shall I be beat out of my master's house, thus? My master, we are <laughs> lords among ourselves, and there we live and reign. Two years already are past of our great empire, and we now write Anno Tertio. But the old man lives that surely will depose you. I'll, in the meantime, I, as the mighty lord and seneschal of this great house and castle, banish thee. The very smell of the kitchen, be it death to appear before the dresser. And why so? Because thou stakest of garlic. Is that breath agreeing with our palace, where each room smells with musk, civet, and rich ambergris, aloes, cassia, aromatic gums, perfumes, and powders, one whose very garments scent of the folds and stables? Oh, fi fi. What a base, nasty rogue tis. 
Get your fella. Then let us put a cart horse in such rich trapping and bring him to the tilt yard. Rank it too. Waste. Riot and consume. Misspend your hours in drunken surfeits. Lose your days in sleep. And burn the night in revels. Drink and drab. Keep Christmas all year long. And blot <laughs> lean length out of the calendar. All that mass of wealth got by my master's sweat and thirsty care. Have a in prodigal usage. Make all fly. Pour it down your oily throats or send it smoking out the top of chimneys. At this dis departure, what's the old man's charge to have his windows glister all night with stars? His modest house turned to a common skews, his beds to pallets of lust and prostitutions, his buttery hatch now made more common than a tavern's bar, his stools that welcomed none but civil guests. Now only free for pandas, whores and boards, strumpets and such. I suffer thee too long. What is to me thy country, or to thee the pleasures of our city? Thou hast cows, cattle, and beavis to feed, oves and boves. These that I keep in this pasture graze are dainty damoiselles, bonny girls. If thou bist born to hedge, ditch, thresh and plow, I to revel banquet and corrals, thou peasant, to the spade and pickaxe, I the baton and stiletto, think it only thy ill, my good, our several lots are cast, and both must be contented. When our both our services are questioned, look thou to one, my answer is provided. And enter young Lionel. Farewell, must cat. And Robin exits. Adieu, good cheese and onions. Stuff thy guts with speck and barley pudding for digestion. Drink whig and sour milk, whilst I rinse my throat with bar Bordeaux and canary. What was he? A spy, sir. One of the hinds of the country that came prying to see what dainty fare our kitchen yields, what guests we harbor and what rule we keep, and threats to tell the old man when he comes. I think I sent him packing. It was well done. A horse and jackanapes, a base baboon, to insinuate our secrets. Let such keep the country where their charge is. So I said, sir. And visit us when we command them thence, not search into our councils. Twere not fit. Who in my father's absence should command, save I, his only son? It is but justice. For am I not now lord? Dominus factotum, and am I not your steward? Well remembered. This night I have a purpose to be merry, jovial, and frolic. How doth our cash hold out? The bag's still heavy. Then my heart's still light. I can assure you, yet yeah, tis pretty deep, though scarce a mile to the bottom. Let me have to supper, let me see, a, a duck. Sweet rogue. A capon. Geld the rascal. Then a turkey. <laughs> now spit him for an infidel. Green plover, snipe, partridge, lark, cock and pheasant. Near a widgeon. Yes, wake thyself at table. <laughs> Where I hope yourself will not be absent. Nor my friends. <laughs> we'll have them in a plenty. Caviar, sturgeon, anchovies, pickled oysters. Yes, and a potato pie. Besides all these, well, what thou thinkst rare and costly. Sir, I know what's to be done. The stock that must be spent is in my hands. And what I have to do, I will do suddenly. No butcher's meat. Of that beware in any case. Oh, I still remember your father was no grazier. If he were, this were a way to eat up all his fields, hedges and all. You will be gone, sir? Yes, and you are in the way of going. Exit Reno. <sighs> to what may young men best compare themselves? Better to what than to a house new built 
the fabric strong, the chambers well contrived, polished within, without, well beautified. When all that gaze upon the edifice do not alone commend the workman's craft, but either make it their fair precedent by which to build another, or at least wish there to inhabit, being set to sail, in comes a slothful tenant with a family as lazy and debauched. Rough tempers rise until the roof, which by their idleness left unrepaired, the stormy showers beat in, rot the main posts and rafters, spoil the rooms, deface the ceilings, and in little space bring it to utter ruin. Yet the fault not in the architecture that first reared it, but him that should repair it. So it fares with us young men. We are those houses made, our parents raise these structures, the foundation laid in our infancy, and as we grow in years, they strive to build us by degrees, story on story, higher, up at a height. They cover us with counsel to defend us from storms without. They polish us within with learnings, knowledge, arts, and discipline, all that is not and vicious they sweep from us like dust and cobwebs and our rooms concealed hang with the costliest hangings about the walls emblems and beauteous symbols pictured round but when that lazy tenant love steps in and in his train brings sloth and negligence lust disobedience and profuse excess the thirst with which our fathers tiled our roof submits to every storm and winter's blast. Uh, enter Blander Hall and Scaffa aboard. And yielding place to every riotous sin gives way without to ruin what's within. <laughs> Such is the state I stand in. And we're going to just stop there before, uh, before we move on. Um, to find out what uh, Blander and Scaffer are all about, although I think we already have a pretty good idea. Um, <laughs> do you know I'm enjoying this play <laughs> so far? Uh, I, I'm I'm really enjoying this. So we we yeah, we moved from this incredibly civilized world <laughs> to one that is no, not quite so civilized, but um, still really enjoyable. Um, we've got here. So we've got let's 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 work out the pecking order. So we've got young Lionel, who's who's the master of the house. We've got Reno, who's his servant, and then we've got Robin, who presumably is a some sort of lower servant. Um, he seems to be the only one who's bothered, doesn't he, <laughs> about the fact that the place is going to rack and ruin. Um, but no one pays any attention to him because he smells of garlic. So hey, um, yeah. Alan. I think Robin is the old family retainer whose loyalty is to the father. Uh, Whereas um, young Lionel yeah. has just come back from his posh school with a hanger on who's on the make. Um, and basically the two of them are going to royster as much away as they can get away with. I mean, as someone yeah. put in the chat, you know, daddy's away, house is free, fine, we'll have a party. Yeah, and if I we wreck the joint, so be it. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't think Reno's a friend, though, is he? He's he, he strikes. He's, de yeah, he's, he's definitely a servant. Oh, he's, he's, he's a ha yeah. yeah, but he's a yeah. hanger on to yeah. to the posh boy. Yeah. Um, Eric, I like this scene because you can't work out whether Reynold is sort of, uh, you know, uh, Reno is kind of um, like manipulating Lionel or just being going along with him if that makes sense because like at the beginning of the scene you can kind of uh you know where robin kind of goes you know there's that elaborate thing of like yeah we're gonna go do this we're gonna go do that it kind of feels very um like reyno is in charge but then when lionel turns up he's like oh yes of course we'll order the duck we'll order the cape and the thing whatever and we're we'll gonna go party yeah yeah and then... we're gonna order absolutely everything by the sounds of it including a snipe does anyone know what a snipe is i think that's a type of a snipe yeah oh snipe. game bird right yes that would make a lot yeah. more sense yeah. okay yeah uh lois i was just interested in that bit about don't get butcher's meat whatever you do why not mm. oh that's for the Question. common people paper trail yes <laughs> oh uh lynn my my guess is that because you don't know how how fresh it is if we butcher our own animals mm -hmm. then we 
from my father's wow. property, then we know that it's we know it that it's fresh. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, for, it's for the common people. It's the, the um, but we have our own animals. We know how they've been raised. We know when they were butchered and prepared. So, yeah. Good, good thought. Uh, Aliki, then Stephen. So uh, I I originally was going to talk about the the elaborate metaphor of the house, which seems like it's going to go somewhere and then goes somewhere completely different, um, which is an interesting contrast with the discussion between uh, Reynold and and Robin about what a house does and what a house is meant to have in it. Um, but I'm distracted by the butcher's meat now. I was going to say that it's just ordinary. Don't get the stuff that anybody can get. Get me only caviar and snipe. And, mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what else it was. All the rare delicacies. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, did I, did I see your hand earlier? Uh, yeah. Um, I find this extraordinarily interesting, really, uh, because it's it seems so retro in the sense that... Um, Firstly, I mean, we are lords within ourselves or whatever. That's a line from Jack Straw in the 1590s. Oh. Uh, and all, uh, loads of the stuff that uh, in the early Robin and um, Raynard uh, scene is is the kind of thing that rebels say in in those 1590s plays, mm. which are, uh, you know, all all about the kind of the kind of satisfaction uh, uh, of, of their appetites, but also the kind of making good of, of injustices and wrongs. Mm. Uh, so I find it really, really interesting that this kind of language, um, it, one, is still around and it's still recognisable. And there's all kinds of overtones here. Uh, so to pick up the kind of Aliki's point about that, you know, the house is, is a metaphor for something else, I think. Uh, and that's not the first time we've, we've come across it. So when, when the kind of profligate young heir comes in, uh, it, I think it says something like, and then we get tempests, and tempest is a real, you know, it's 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 a word which has got all sorts of kind of uh, overtones of social disorder there. Um, so I think, that, I mean, I, I can't unpack the whole thing, but I think it's extraordinarily interesting mm. um, uh, in terms of a metaphor, and so and and it's really retro, in uh, in well, possibly consciously retro, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe not, maybe not consciously old fashioned, but it's it's stuff that we see. 30 years before and the other before you know, I will shut up but the other bit that's <laughs> retro is that um young Lionel's speech about the house uh, it, it could be from a 1570s morality play with a little bit of a tweak you know it's kind of Brechtian thing he's sort of standing outside himself he's saying this is what we heirs do you know uh, to the audience directly you know he's not quite a vice mm -hmm. um but it's pretty clear what side the audience should be on you know there's there's a, there's a kind of element of uh laying bare the the sort of moral and practical implications of this kind of profligate young heir which reminds me very much of of plays from 50 or 60 years before mm. yeah that's really interesting i f i find the um the links to the the kind of um the the revolutionary and the you know the whole drax draw thing quite interesting um is that i wonder i mean we don't know as yet um but i wonder if that's it you know it, it must be deliberate if it's a direct quote but um is it perhaps satirizing it to a degree i'm wondering but like because but because that was all about you know genuine political unrest um, I, I think and this Sorry. is like now, well, this is now taking something that was once about high stakes and, you know, people's lives and the rebellion that then was going on across the country and was about, you know, sort of serious matters is now actually the rebellion of it's it's been sort of brought down to the domestic level and it's about the son, um, you know, rebelling against against the father. Um, maybe, I don't know, uh, but maybe it's more important than that. But I'm just wondering if it is just a um, like a, a bit of a, a, a satirizing of that older style, maybe. Stephen, come, do come back to me before. Um, I well, I, I, I don't think they're necessarily quoting Jack Straw so much as it's it's just a common kind of trope in the language. Mm, I'm okay. pretty sure that's where 
where Jack Straw got it from. We are lords, you know, we are lords within ourselves or, or variants on that. Um, you know, you can read that very, very politically as about lordship, or you can just read it as a kind of a character point. I wonder about the domestication. Um, I mean, I, you can you can equally read it uh, um, as showing the deep rootedness of radical social critique. That it it's you know it's uh, it isn't just about changing people at the top. There's a you know going going way back going. Back to the Reformation, there's this kind of Commonwealth and community discourse, which is about the, um, everything being in its proper place, including, you know, the people for whom on whom we rely for hospitality and charity and all of those things that the, the clown has set up. Um, mm. You know, so uh, I think I think there's, you know, you you need to do a real real deep dive. I think um, it's it's cer certainly possible to see it your way. I think you know, it's a kind of it's a kind of etiolated. Uh, you know, sort of tail tail end of what was radical, but but equally, you know, <laughs> we're less than twenty years from a civil war, when mm. all of this stuff busts out again, you know, uh, and so uh, it's it's possible that you know this is the kind of Japanese knotweed of of kind of <laughs> social <laughs> critique, you know, uh, it, it's yeah. rhizomatic or whatever, some kind of Ponzi theoretical mm. word, you know, you you can't actually get rid of it because it's. Mm. It's very, very deeply rooted. Mm. Keeps coming back, keeps raising its head. I saw lots of hands. Um, I saw Francis and then Lois and then Alan. Um, let's start with you, Francis, because you had your hand up a, a while ago. Yeah, um, one thing I, I couldn't help thinking when um, young Lana was reading through that list of um, provisions that he wanted for dinner, it kind of gives a clue to his character's physicality. I mean, he must be enormous. <laughs> I don't know, it depends how old he is, doesn't it? If he's, if, he's, if he's like 18 years old, he's just probably one of those guys who eats constantly and just remains rink thin. Mm, just the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lois. Uh, yeah, the there's obviously a sort of rebellion going on here, but uh, I mean, it's partly just the son against the father. You know, it's about time that the old guys died and let us do what we want. And uh, but with the servant, Reynold, it's more interesting because uh, uh, he's, he's only doing what he's told to do, but he's doing what he wants to do, obviously. And it becomes more of a social rebellion kind of thing, I think. Yeah. Um, Alan. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether there is an element of political satire in here um, with effectively the old Lionel, who we haven't yet met, um, standing in for James and young Lionel being Charles, you know, and who was, I mean, they neither were actually known for parsimony in their uh, personal behaviour. Um, but I wonder whether there's this political satire going on there. Could be. I I don't know enough about Stuart Kings to 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 have a, a thought about it one way or the other. But yeah, who knows, Eric? And then I think we should move on, unless anyone's got um, anything that they're dying to say. Go, going going back to the whole house thing, I think it's also kind of. Um the like young Lionel's speech is basically like yes we are showered with love we can't blah, blah, blah. but then sort of like um he kind of aside from going oh yes i could be nice i could do all these good things and be a good person but i won't um <laughs> but he, he does that but also it kind of feels like he's subtracting um agency from or detracting agency i don't know what the right word would be from himself because he kind of goes Yes, well, you know, they shower all these things on us and then sort of um, the, the roof by their idleness left un, unrepaired. It's like sort of not some not my fault that I'm like this. It's basically someone else's fault <laughs> because I've been spoiled or, you know, kind of, um, I don't know. It's just an interesting speech kind of. And then like that lazy tenant love steps in and it's like kind of uh, like Stephen said, he's creating the sort of vice character for himself. Um, like sort of the you know angel devil on the shoulder kind of thing yeah yeah sort of he's internalizing it all mm. right uh, does anyone else have anything that they're dying to say uh if not let's carry on so um 
Yeah, it's turned into a very tasty scene, this, in more ways than one. So we've just had the entrance of uh, Blander a whore and Scaffer aboard. So take it away, Blander. And uh, how doth this tire become me? Mother ask how your sweet carriage and court behaviour do best grace you for lover's regard, not so much the outward habit as that which the garment covers. Oh, here's that hail, shower, tempest, storm, and gust that shattered hath this building. Let in lust, intemperance, appetite to vice, with all neglect of every goodness. Thus I see how I am sinking in mine own disease, yet I cannot abide it. Uh, and how this gown? Uh, I prithee, view me well, and speak with thy best judgment. Do you talk of gowns and ornaments that have a beauty precious in itself, that becomes anything? Let me not live, but she speaks not but truth, and I'll for that reward her. All's one to me, be become they me or not, or be I fair or foul in others' eyes, so I appear so to my Lionel. He is the glass in whom I judge my face, by whom in order I will dress these curls and place these jewels only to please him. Why a smile? To hear a woman that think herself so wise speak so foolishly that knows well and does ill. Uh, teach me wherein I err. I'll tell thee, daughter in that thou knowest thyself to be beloved of so many, and settlest thy affections only upon one. Doth the mill grind only when the wind sits in one corner, or ships only sail when it's in this or that quarter? Is he a cunning fencer that lies at the, but at one guard? Or is he a skilful musician that plays but on one string? Is there but one way to the wood? And but one bucket that belongs to the well? To affect one and despise all other becomes the precise matron, not the prostitute, the loyal wife, not the loose wanton. Such have I been as you are now, and should learn to sail with all winds, defend all blows, make music with all strings, know all the ways to the wood, and like a good travelling hackney, learn to drink of all waters. May I miscarry in my Blanda's love if I, that old damnation, do not send to hell before her time? I, I would not have you, mother, teach me aught that tends to injure him. Well, look to it when tis late, and then repent at leisure as I have done. Thou seest, here's nothing but prodigality and pride, wantoning and wasting, rioting and revelling, spoiling and spending, gluttony and gormandizing. All goes to havoc, and can this hold out? When he hath nothing left to help himself, how can he harbour thee? Look at length to drink from a dry bottle and feed from an empty knapsack. Look to it, it'll come to that. My parsimony shall begin in thee, and instantly. For from this hour I vow that thou no more shalt drink upon my cost, nor taste the smallest fragment from my board. I'll see thee starve in the street first. Live to one man? Hm, a jest. Thou mayst as well tie thyself to one gown. And what fool but will change with the fashion? Yes, do. Confine thyself to one garment and use no variety. See so how soon it will rot and turn to rags. Those rags be thy reward. Oh, my sweet Blanda, only for thee I wish my father dead and ne'er to rouse us from our sweet delight. But for this hag, this beldam, she whose back hath made her items in my mercer's book, whose ravenous guts I have stuffed with delicates, nay, even to surfeit, and whose frozen blood I have warmed with aquae vitae, be this day my last of bounty to a wretch ingrate. But unto thee, a new indenture scaled, of an affection fixed and permanent, I'll love thee still, 
be it but to give the lie to this old cankered worm. Nay, be not angry. With thee my soul shall ever be at peace, but with this love seducer still at war. Enter Rioter and two gallants. Hear me but speak. Ope, but thy lips again, it makes a way to have thy tongue plucked out. We are all in tempest. Yes. And the storm raised by that witch's spell. Oh, tis a damned enchantress. Uh, what's the business? Only some few words slipped her unawares. For my sake, make her peace. Oh, you charge me deeply. Come from, will you be moved? Women's words? A man of your known judgment? Had you but heard the damn the erroneous doctrine that she taught you would have judged her to the stake but sweetheart she now recants those errors once more number her among your household servants oh shall she beg and be denied aught from you come this kiss shall end all former quarrels it is not possible these lips should move in vain the two ways plead both in their speech and silence. You have prevailed. But upon this condition, no way else I'll censure her as she hath sentenced thee, but with some small inversion. Gaff, speak, how's that? Uh, not too severe, I prithee. See, poor wretch, she at the bar stands quaking. Now hold up. How, oh, man, how? Her hand, I mean. And now I'll sentence thee according to thy counsel given to her. Sail by one wind, thou shalt. Sing to one, one to one tune sing. Lie at one guard and play but one string. Henceforth I will confine thee to one garment, and that shall be a cast one like thyself. Just past all wearing as thou, past all use, and not to be renewed till it be as ragged as thou art rotten. Nay, sweet. That, for her habit. Cold shoes I have on it. To prevent surfeit, thy diet shall be but one to one dish confined, and that, too, rifled with as unclean hands as e'er were laid on thee. When he scats me in vittles, I would but allow, allow once in drink. That shall be the refuse of the flagons, jacks, and snuffs, such as the nastieth breath shall leave of wine and strong water, never hope henceforth to smell. Oh me, I faint already. If I sink in my state of all the rest, be thou excused. What thou proposed to her, Beldam, is now against thy self-decreed. Drink from dry springs, from empty knapsacks feed. No burnt wine, nor hot waters. She Take swims. Her. Take her hands. Ah, oh, indeed, you are too cruel. Yes, to her. Only of purpose to be kind to thee. Are any of my guests come? Oh, fear not, sir. You will have a full table. What, and music? Yeah, best consort in the city for six parts. Oh, we shall have songs then. But the yeah. And wenches. Yes. But the eye. Uh-huh. Uh, what was that you said? And, uh, we will have such to bear you company as will no doubt content you. Enter then! In youth there is a fate that sways us still to know what's good and yet pursue what's ill. And they all exit and that's the end of the scene. Oh, that took a turn. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in t as to the tone of this. Um, are we supposed to find uh, young Lionel's punishment there? Are we supposed to find that funny? Do you think? Because mm. I have to say, I was I was finding that kind of deeply disturbing. But I'm wondering if that's me looking at it with a contemporary eye, uh, Lois than Stephen. Yeah, I was a bit puzzled by that too. I mean, uh, I actually was reading Blanda at the beginning on the assumption that she meant to be overheard by Lionel, and that was why she was going 
going on about how all she cared about was pleasing him, but the, and the, that the whole conversation might have been meant to uh, to indicate that you know whatever the, the, the board said she she adored this guy because obviously that's what her future depends on this is believing that she loves him, but then it looked as if that wasn't the case and they really didn't know they were being overheard. Uh, though, so it depends on how you stage this, obviously. Uh, but yes, and she obviously is very fond of uh, this woman that she calls mother, who may well be the closest thing to a mother that she knows. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I take it that Scaffa is giving what she considers to be important advice. Hmm. Uh, Stephen. Uh, yeah, there's, there's an element of grotesque in the description, I think. You know, this, this thing of, you know, whose ravenous guts I have stuffed with mm -hmm. delicates. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind, it's yeah. kind of Lent versus Carnival a little bit, I think, you know, that, that the, the sign that he is actually, you know, a worthy suitor uh, is, is that he, he kind of, um, even though he calls himself a prodigal and even though we've seen him just plotting all kinds of sort of physical excess, as it were, with, you know, food and drink with, with the steward, uh, he, he disciplines somebody else. Uh, so I, I wonder. I wonder if that's part of what's going on. That she's she's presented as a kind of excessive, grotesque figure in his language, um, and uh, and also, I mean, I I find um, I find the language of, of the board. You know, the, the that kind of great speech, which is which is all proverbial. You know, it's it's all kind of you know you know buckets going to the well that that bit. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's a really really interesting kind of uh, set of words to put in the in the mouth. You know, if this was a tragedy, mm -hmm. you know, we'd be in sort of, you know women beware women type territory. Mm -hmm. You know, it wouldn't be as um, um, I don't know um, homely mm. the language. You know, it's mm. it's so this is again which you know to me is is really retro. It kind of takes you back. Uh, you know, 50 years or so. So, but then again, I don't know anything about 1620. So, what do I know? Well, you and me both. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, it's also, it, it strikes me, if that speech were to be um, not just in a different kind of play, but but put into the mouth of a man, um, if, into a male character, he would suddenly turn into like really quite sage and eloquent advice. Um, you know, um, I think it's sage and eloquent advice anyway. Well, no, exactly. It is. It is sage and eloquent advice, but it's like, but because it's in the mouth of the board, it's like we're perhaps meant oh, to see it this a particular way. I mean, also what you said about excess. Um, I mean, she stands for excess in his world and he punishes her, but his punishment is itself quite excessive. I, I, I feel. It's quite I mean, grotesque. I, it, it, it is, and there's just something about it that is making me kind of uncomfortable. Um, Aliki and then Alan and then Eric. So, yeah, I mean, it is very good advice. You know, don't mm. don't put uh, all your hopes on this young idiot. Eventually, he's going to drink everything he has. And then where will you be? Um, and the reply, I mean, on the one hand, it's it's justified. Fine. Why should I feed you to speak against me? Why should I maintain you in good state, state to give advice that I don't want? But it is grotesque and it's kind it's it's misogynist as well. The way that he talks about her as beyond all use. What the mm. hell is way is that to speak about a human being? <laughs> right? Mm. Yeah. And that's that's what sit, sticks in my craw. On the other hand, I do quite understand his point. Why should I have you here eating at my expense if what you're going to do is try and talk my girlfriend out of being out of being faithful to me? Mm. Yeah, um, Alan, then Eric, then Francis. I, I must admit, my feeling is that uh, young Lionel is simply throwing his weight around because there's, there's a distinct lack of anybody to keep him under control. And, you know, oh, I'm a posh boy. I can get away with what I want. And I'll be as rude as I like to everybody as, as long as I can get away with it. Mm. There is a sense of almost that he's, yeah, that he's sort of playing at being the master mm. here. There's, yeah. It's 
it's it's it's sort of like because Aiki's right, you know, on on the one hand, you can say, yeah, he's perfectly justified in his in his response to her. But then he just the response he has is he seems to be very excessive and it does like stray into the grotesque. And it's it's like, is it that thing of like, oh, this is the first time I've done that? You know, I, I am punishing servants in my father's house. And so he just takes it too far. But I'm not sure if we're meant to be reading that into it or or not. I can't tell. Um, Eric, and then I saw Francis's hand, and then Lois. Uh, I think also there might be an element of sort of, well, not quite ageism, but like sort of, you know, that thing of, well, you're old and, eat, you know, beyond use here being like, you're kind of like, you know, sometimes they talk about pensioners or uh, people who are sort of, you know, the disabled people or whatever, sort of as being um, sort of beyond like not adding to the, the the productivity of the system in terms of capitalism uh of course that's not true uh, as we know <laughs> uh, but uh yeah it's kind of that thing of uh, i feel like he's kind of because he his last two lines in that in that scene are basically in youth there's a fate where we can sort of you know um let me just find the lines one um so i don't misquote <laughs> um the in, in youth there's a fate when we know what is good but we do what's ill so it's kind of like I know, I know what I'm meant to be. Like what's good, but I choose not to do it. Mm. Whereas uh, he has, as in, he has the luxury because he's young. He could like waste himself away, kind of thing. Maybe I don't know. Mm. Um, it was Francis, then Lois, then Stephen. Yeah, I think um, I think Sca um, moving on from what Eric said, I think Scaffa is this elderly prostitute who is you know who can no longer earn her living and she seems very dependent on uh uh Blanda who um uh you know is her who gives her access to um Lionel's largesse and I you know you can see that Lionel is like you know why are you turning your my girlfriend against me when you're you know when you're completely reliant on my charity. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Lois. Oh, oh, I thought it wasn't somebody else ahead of me. Oh, oh maybe. No, I think it was you. Oh, oh, okay, right. Okay. No, I was just going to say the most obvious thing. It seemed to me that the, this is just, uh, you know, the uh, Scaffa is old and obviously fat and uh, uh, deserves all the stupid jokes can be made about her. I mean, I think, you know, the fact that she's got these asides that uh, I wish she would give me a, a, a lot of drink and make up for the fact that I'm not getting any food. And then she faints when she discovers she's not going to be allowed wine and hot alcoholic drinks. So, I mean, she's being completely ridiculed, it seems. And I think it's probably I think she may well be meant to be funny. Uh, yeah, that was my that was my thought. I was wondering if it was meant to be funny. I I, I really don't find it funny, and I don't think you could yeah. stage it today without addressing that mm -hmm. misogyny and uh, ageism. Mm -hmm. um, but it's 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 interesting because I I I have a suspicion that it was meant to be funny in the original, but although for for me it's mm -hmm. kind of taken it into much darker territory. Um, Stephen, and then unless anyone else has anything that they're bursting to say, we'll move on. Uh, just a response to, to Alan's point about, about self-control. Um, this, this again speaks to, uh, you know, the kind of morality play, doesn't it? You know, we have a, 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 char a, a character comes on who's called Rioter, which I thought, oh, you know, we're going to have trouble in the streets. But actually, it's, it's, a, it's a morality play. Mm -hmm. term isn't it we've literally got a character called riot you know he might as well be called <laughs> young lusty or something yeah. like that who teams up uh and so you have this sort of central figure who everybody is trying to influence and they all represent various kinds of um undesirable things in different ways mm. um and i i think that it's really really nicely poised at this point because as people have said you know scaffer is actually talking good sense you know if you if if this is a kind of morality figure who is going to go down, then yeah, you should just keep clear of them. And actually, you know, the, um, it's um, it's the prostitute who is needing to kind of steer the way. You know, is mm -hmm. she the centre of this moral discourse, mm -hmm. or is it or is it the kind of uh, lad of the household? We might suspect which way it's going to go. But I think it's really really nicely poised at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's it's got all kinds of layers to it. This, which I'm, uh, 
enjoying um, a great deal. Unless anyone has anything that they're bursting to say, let's move on then to Act Two. We're now into Act Two, Scene One, and um, yes, we're back. We're back to the 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 jolly um, <laughs> atmosphere of uh, of Win Wincut and his wife. Let's see how if it stays jolly. Uh, enter old Master Wincut and his wife. And what's this Delaville? My apprehension can give him no more true expression than that he first appears, a gentleman, and that well-conditioned. That for outward show, but what in him have you observed else to make him better known? I have nor eyes to search into the inward thoughts of men, nor ever was studied in that art to judge of men's affection by the face. But that which makes me best opinioned of him is that he's companion and the friend beloved of him, whom you so much commend, the noble master, Geraldine. Thou well, hast spoke that which not only crowns his true desert, but now instates him in my better thoughts, making his worth unquestioned. He pretends love to my sister Prue. I have observed him single her out to private conference. But I could rather, for her own sake, wish young Geraldine would fix his thoughts that way, and she towards him. In such affinity, trust me, I would not use a sparing hand. But love in these kinds should not be compelled, forced, nor persuaded. When it freely springs and of itself takes voluntary root, it grows, it spreads, it ripens, and brings forth such a usurious crop of timely fruit as crowns a plenteous autumn. Enter Clown. Such a harvest, I should not be the ungladdest man to see of all my thy sister's friends. Now, whence come you? Who? I, sir? From a lodging of largesse, a house of hospitality, a palace of plenty, where there's feeding like horses and drinking like fishes, where for pints we're served in pottles, instead of pottle pots, in pails? Instead of silver tankards, we drink out of water tankards. Claret runs as freely as the cocks, and canary like the conduits of a coronation day, where there's nothing but feeding and frolicking, carousing and kissing, drinking and dancing, music and madding, fiddling and feasting. And where, I pray thee, are all these revels kept? Well, they may rather be called wrecks than rebels. As I came along by the door, I was called up amongst them. He gallants and she gallants. I no sooner looked out, I saw them out with their knives, slashing of shoulders, mangling of legs, and launching of loins, till there was scarce a whole limb left amongst them. A fearful massacre. One was hacking to cut off a neck. This was mangling a breast. His knife slipped from the shoulder, cut off only a wing. One was picking the brains out of her head. Another was knuckle deep in her belly. I was groping for a liver. Another searching for the kidneys. I, want, I saw one pluck the soul from the body. Goose that she was to suffer it. Another pricked into the breast with his one bill. Woodcock to endure it. How fell they out at first? No, not that. Well, it seems one had a stomach, another had a stomach. But there was such biting and tearing with their teeth. I'm sure I saw some of their poor carcasses pay for it. Did they not send for surgeons? No, alas, no. Surgeon's help was too late. There was no stitching up of those wounds where limb was plucked from limb. Nor any salve for those scars which all the plaster of Paris cannot cure. Where grew the, the quarrel first? It seems it was first broached in the kitchen. Certain creatures being brought in thither by some of the house. The cook, being a choleric fellow, did so toss them and toss them, so pluck them and pull them, till he left them as naked as my nail. Pinioned some of them like felons, cut the spurs from others of their heels, then down went his spits. Some of them he ran out of the throat and out the backside. <laughs> About went his basting label where he said, did so 
besource them at many a shrewd turn they had amongst them. But in all this, how did the women escape? Oh, they fared best. It did the least hurt that I saw, but for quietness sake, were forced to swallow what is not yet digested. Yet everyone had their share, and she that had least, I'm sure by this time, hath her belly full. And where was all this havoc kept? Marry, sir, at your next neighbour's young master Lionel, where there is nothing but drinking out of dry fats and healthing in half tubs. His guests are fed by the belly. Beggars served at his gate in baskets. He's the, the, the adamant of this age, the daffodil of these days, the prince of prodigality and the very Caesar of all young citizens. Like then was a massacre of meat, not as I apprehended. <laughs> Your gravity hath guessed aright. The chiefest that fell in this battle were wild fowl and tame fowl. Pheasants were wounded instead of alpharest. Capons for captains. Anchovies stood for ancients. Caviar for corporals. Dishes were assaulted instead of ditches. Rabbits were cut to pieces upon the rebelling. Some lost their legs, whilst other of their wings were forced to fly. The pioneer undermined nothing but pie crust and Enough, enough. Your wit hath played too long upon her patience. What it grieves me much for both the young man and the old man. The one grazes his head with care, and use the parching heat and biting cold, the terrors of the lands and peers at sea and travel, only to gain some competent estate to leave his son. Whilst all that merchandise through gulfs, cross tides, pirates, and storms he brings so far, the other here shipwrecks in the harbor. Is the care of fathers and the weakness incident to youth that wants experience. And I'm just going to pause there mid-scene. Uh, we can't stick around uh, and talk about this too much, but I figured people would have something to say about, about this rather brilliant opening to the scene and this um, general launching of loins. Um, Alan. Yeah, I mean, I, it has the feel to me that this is the clown stand-up act of how, how many times can I get alliteration into the same sentence without actually tripping over myself? Mm -hmm. And I think it does kick back to a comment that was made in the chat earlier of Haywood having had experience of playing the clown himself, whether this was actually something he'd penned with himself in mind. Yeah, it was Lois who made that point earlier about the fact that um, Haywood used to play the, crowd, uh, the clown. Um, I yeah it's i can i can imagine him him salivating at the thought of performing this uh is that a hand lois or uh, no? yeah i was going to say that he, he's pretty old by now i mean his career began in the 1590s you know so uh he may well have retired from acting by this time but he certainly did play clowns yeah and and wrote clown parts for himself mm. stephen um this is this is rabelais this is straight out of kind of this sort of late medieval mm. grotesque, you know, it, um, what's his name? Bosch, you know, mm. it's a kind of Bosch painting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, Bruegel, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's yeah. I, I mean, it is in, part of the point of those paintings, if you like, and part of the point of the grotesque is just the sheer kind of invention, you know, in, in, a, in a world where, you know, some writers want things that are kind of classical planes, as it were, you know. Uh, this this is sprouting stuff in all directions. I think I think so. That's that's one thing, and I will, I will be very brief. Uh, but the other thing is, then you get this kind of uh, the audience knows what's going on. Then you've got this stupid person who it all has to be explained to, yeah. and typically in very Rabelaisian fashion, he explains at great length and is likely to have gone on for another page if somebody <laughs> didn't shut him up. There's that kind of a plenitude. Here. You know, this this mm. clown is absolutely kind of inexhaustible mm. uh, in terms of invention. Yeah, absolutely. Invention and excess. This play to me seems to be dealing with excess in uh, or looking at excess in different ways and, and uh, different forms. And I, I'm finding it all quite interesting. Um, unless anyone has anything else, does, does, does someone? 
Are you desperate to say something, Eric? I, yep. I, I'm just trying not to, like, when I, I, I edited this play, so for, you know, the people who were, I mean, along with Helen, and having read this scene, like, three, two times or three times or however many times I read it and before, and now, I still, like, have, the, the, it still confuses the hell out of me. There was a part of me going, is this an orgy? is this an actual fight is this a is this a sort of drunken drunken fight an orgy a feast something like that and it's like whoa okay cool i just like the description yeah no it is it's really great and i love that um that analogy to bosch that that you made Stephen, because it's just yeah with the fox going in it's <laughs> i mean even though even though the audience most of them will know that it is about the fowls um straight away there's still the imagery that it that it it creates in your brain of the you know the fox yeah. going in um right shall we move on um and finish off this scene enter young geraldine dalaville uh prudentula laughing <laughs> and we start back with the clown sorry uh, yeah, I was at the beginning of the battle, but here comes some that it seems were at the rifling of the dead carcasses, but by their mirth, they had part of the spoil. You are a pleasant gentleman. What I intrigued might be the subject of your pleasant sport. It promiseth some pleasure. If their recreation be, as I make no question, on truth grounded, it will beget sudden laughter. What's the project? Who shall relate it? Master Geraldine, if there be anything can please my ear with pleasant sounds, your tongue must be the instrument on which the string must strike. It is then. Nay, hear it. That is a good one. We entreat you, who possess us of the novel. Speak, good sir. I shall then, with a kind of barbarism, shadow a jest that asks a smoother tongue, for in my poor discourse, I do protest will but lose his luster. You are modest. However, speak, I pray, for my sake, do it. This is like a hasty pudding, longer in eating than it was in making. <laughs> then thus it is. This gentleman and I passed just now by your next neighbor's house, where, as they say, dwells one young Lionel. Where I was tonight at supper. An unf unthrift youth his father now at sea. Why, that's the very subject upon which it seems this jest is grounded. There is this night, there this night was a great feast. Why, so I told you, sir. Be thou still dumb, tis he that I would hear. In the height of their carousing, all their brains warmed with the heat of wine, discourse was offered of ships and storms at sea, and when suddenly, out of his giddy wildness, one conceives the room wherein they quaffed, to be a pinnace, moaning and floating, and the confused noise to be the murmuring of winds, gusts, mariners, that their unsteadfast footing did proceed from the rocking of the vessel. This conceived each one begins to apprehend the danger and to look out for safety. Fly, saith one, up to the main top and discover. He climbs by the bedpost to the tester, there reports a turbulent sea and tempest towards, and wills them that if they'll save their ship and lines to cast their lading overboard. At this, all fall to work and hoist into the street as to the sea. What next comes to their hand? Stools, tables, trestles, trenchers, bedsteads, cups, pots, plate, and glasses, where a fellow whistles, here a fellow whistles, they take him for the bosun. One lies struggling upon the floor as if he swam for life. A third takes the base vial for the cock boat, sits in the belly on it, labors and rows. His oar, the stick with which the fiddler played. A fourth bestrides his fellow, thinking to escape as did Arian on the dolphin's back, still fumbling on the gittern. Excellent spot. But what was the conclusion? The rude multitude watching without and gaping for the spoil cast from the windows went by the ears about it. 
The constable is called to atone the broil, which done, and hearing such a noise within of eminent shipwreck, enters the house and finds them in this confusion. They adore his staff and think it Neptune's trident that he comes with his tritons, so they call his watch, to calm the tempest and so appease the waves. And at this point, we left them. Come what will, I'll steal out of doors and see the end of it. That's certain. And he exits. Thanks, Master Geraldine, for this discourse. In truth, it hath much pleased me, but the night begins to grow fast on us. For your parts, you are all young and you may sit late. My eyes may begin to summon me to sleep, then nothing's more offensive unto age than to watch long and late. Now, good rest with you. And there's no actual original stage direction, but it's kind of inferred that exit wink. Uh, wink or exit somewhere around here. What says fair Prudentilla? Maids and widows, and we young bachelors, such as indeed are forced to live in solitary beds and sleep without disturbance, we, methinks, should desire later hours when married wines that in their amorous arms hug their delights to often waking subject their more haste may better be excused. How can you that are, as you confess, a single man, enter so far into these mystical secrets of marriage, which as yet you never proved? There's, lady, an instinct innate in man, which prompts us to the apprehensions of the uses we were born to. Such we are aptest to learn, ambitious most to know, of which our chief is marriage. What you men most meditate, we women seldom dream of. When dream maids most? Uh, when think you? When you lie upon your backs. Come, come, your ear. Exit Dalleville and Prudentilla. We are now left alone. Why say we be? Who should be jealous of us? This is not the first of many hundred nights that we two have been private from the first of our acquaintance. When our tongues but clipped our mother tongue and could not speak it plain, we knew each other. As in stature, so increased our sweet society, since you travel, your travel and my late marriage, through my husband's loan, midnight have been as midday, and my bedchamber as free to you as your own father's house, and you as welcome to it. I must confess it is in you, your noble courtesy, in him a more than common confidence, and in this age can and in this age can scarce find precedent. Most true, it is with all an argument that both our virtues are so deep impressed in his good thoughts, he knows we cannot err. A villain were he to deceive such trust, or were there one a much worse character? And she, no less, whom either beauty, youth, time, place, or opportunity could tempt to injure such a husband. You deserve, even for his sake, to be ever young, and he for yours to have his youth renewed, so mutual is your true conjugal love. Yet the, the fate so pleased. I know your meaning was once voiced that we two should have matched, the world so thought, and many tongues so spake. But heaven hath now disposed us other ways, and being as it is, a thing in me which I protest was never wished nor sought, now done, I do not repent it. In those times of all the treasures of my hopes and love, you were the exchequer, they were stored in you, and had not my unfortunate travel crossed them, they had been here reserved still. Troth they had. I should have been your trusty treasurer. However, let us love still, I entreat, that neighborhood and breeding will allow. So much the laws divine and human both twixt brother and sister will approve. Heaven then forbid that they should limit us, wish well to one another. If they should not, we might proclaim they were not charitable, which were a deadly sin but to conceive. Will you resolve me one thing? As to one that in my bosom hath a second place next my dear husband. That's the thing I crave, and only that, to have a place 
next him. Presume on that already. But perhaps you mean to stretch it further? Only thus far. Your husband's old, to whom my soul doth wish a Nestor's age, so much he merits from me. Yet if, as proof and nature daily teach, men cannot always live, especially such as are old and crazed, he be called hence fairly in full maturity of time, and we too be reserved to after life, will you confer your widowhood on me? You ask the thing I was about to beg. Your tongue hath spake mine own thoughts. Vow to that. As I hope mercy. Tis enough. That word alone instates me happy. Now, so please you, we will divide you to your private chamber and I to find out my friend. Nay, Master Geraldine, one ceremony rests yet unperformed. My vow is past. Your oath must next proceed. And as you covet to be sure of me, of you, I would be certain. Make ye doubt. No doubt, but love still jealous, and in that to be excused. You then shall swear by heaven, and as in all your future acts you hope to thrive and prosper, as the day may yield comfort or the night rest, as you would keep entire the honor of your father's house and free your name from scandal and reproach by all the goodness that you hope to enjoy or ill to shun. You charge me deeply, lady. Till that day come, you shall reserve yourself a single man. Converse not company with any woman, contract nor combine with maid or widow, which expected hour as I do wish not haste. So when it happens, it shall not come unwelcome. You hear all this, vow this. By all that you have said, I swear, and by this kiss, confirm. You are now my brother, but then my second husband. And they exit, and that's the end of the scene. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, come on. I mean, you, they were childhood sweethearts, and then he went away, and she married an older man, and she doesn't regret it in the slightest, and he thinks... <laughs> The husband is just great and wishes a long life on him. But when he does eventually die, he wants to marry her when she's a widow and she she pledges it and then he pledges it to stay single till that happens. And oh, what could possibly go wrong? This is just <laughs> such a sweet bunch of people here. Like, I, I don't see any problem with this, this situation whatsoever. Um, Eric, then Lois, then Lynn. I just like how as soon as Baxter, no, I'm kidding. I, I, I just, um, I, I like how um, I put it in the chat as well. That um, basically Haywood is kind of showing off. He's he's showing off his range. He's got like this full sort of, you know, he's good at like writing the comedy scenes. He's good at writing the sort of romantic scenes. And this is, I mean, okay, it's shady in some ways, but it's, I mean, in terms of plot and context, uh, but just kind of, it's actually quite well written. Yeah, it's beautifully written. I mean, it's context is everything, isn't it? We were talking about um, Scatha's speech earlier being like really sage advice. And this is a, actually a really romantic scene. Like the take, put it in a different context. It could be, yeah, could could have totally different sort of um, a totally different tone to it. Uh, Lois, and then it was Lynn. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is beautifully written. I mean, that opening bit about how they'd spent so much time together and were just sort of used to each other and so on. It was it was really nice and such easy blank verse, which doesn't draw attention to itself, but just mm. sounds really, really good. Um, the only thing is I do feel sorry for Prudentilla, who's obviously crazy about this guy and who's clearly not going to get a proposal from him. Uh, I mean, she is sort of vaguely flirting with his friend, but I don't know that she's as keen on him. Yeah, I think he's more into her, isn't he, than she's mm. into him. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, then Stephen. Yeah, I was thinking this would be a really fruitful scene to uh, to excise and give to acting students. Um, because you could play it, a, you know, sort of prima facie, uh, 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 they mean what they say. You know, we we're always really, really good friends. We were close. I'm married. I'm not, I don't regret that. Um, we both admire my husband. We don't wish him ill, but 
but but we still care about each other and we'll make a good match um if that if it comes to that you know or you could play it that there's this just like powerful erotic subcurrent and they really they're not going to be able to keep their hands <laughs> off each other uh they're 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 not going to keep it wholesome it's just like um they're saying that but really they're like i want you i want you i want you i want you so mm-hmm. so you know, I think actors could do some really interestingly layered stuff with this. There's so many different ways you could play this scene. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a really good point. And you could say that about so much of this play mm-hmm. we've read so far, really? actually. It's it's very juicy. Uh, Stephen? Uh, yeah, just to kind of a, a word uh, about the structure of it as well. One of the reasons that these scenes land so well is they're preceded by this insane description from the clown of these uh, these kind of uh, pissed up posh boys LARPing a shipwreck. Yeah. You know, one of them suddenly gets the idea and everybody joins in and they go for it 100%. And so we're in that yeah. world of the kind of, um, <laughs> if, you know, if, if what I was saying about the morality thing before was, was true then, you know, uh, the devil's got the best tunes here, you know, that it's, <laughs> It's by no means a kind of, you know, just say no morality, is it? It's brilliant. It sounds absolutely a hoot. Yeah. That's that's a great thing. And then after that, yeah. you know, we turn on a sixpence and we get this, uh, as everyone's already said, you know, this gorgeous romantic and and kind of sad scene, you know, following straight on after it. Which, which is one of the reasons why it, it lands so well, I think, that we've, we've, you know, we've just kind of, you know, roadrunner screeched to a halt. And we're expecting, you know, more of the same. We've been set up for that. And it just kind of completely turns a corner. Yeah. So it's great structurally. It is great structurally. And I just wanted to pick up on something that you said there, because it's not the clown who actually has that description. It's young Geraldine. No. And in fact, I think that makes it, that's even cleverer to put it in his mouth not in the clowns because it gives it more um kind of credibility in a way you know like if it was the clown saying it you'd be like oh yeah okay did this actually happen but actually it's all this excess has been witnessed by um by the hero yes who then goes on to have this really like warm and, and sincere and beautiful scene um we've all been to parties like that um <laughs> lois then lynn yeah. Yes, I'd meant to say earlier that 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 whole description of the the drunks who decide that they're on a, a ship that's sinking that's actually a classical trope. I mean, uh, Haywood uh, was quite well versed in the classics and did a lot of translations, and he did a little book called Pleasant Dialogues and Dramas, which are kind of mini plays based on classical episodes. And this is something. I mean, other people have written it too. I think uh, Abraham Cowley did did a play called Naufragium Joculare. Uh, I think the whole thing was in Latin, but that's what this is, the jocular shipwreck, the, the joke shipwreck. Oh. And, uh, um, and I think, in fact, I'm beginning to see that the, uh, the whole um, Lionel Reginald plot, I think, is taken from Plotus's The Haunted House. Uh, uh, so this is all, I mean, Haywood is doing a very skillful job of combining a lot of different sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know a source for the the, the Geraldine uh, plot, but there there may well be one. But he's, uh, you know, this very delicate handling of of the scene between these two people, and then we've got a a whole uh, set piece that really has a classical source that some people anyway probably would have recognized. I'm just wondering. Uh, now you've said that with this, um, I wonder if you were staging this today, whether you could actually have like get that scene onto the stage. Mm-hmm. um in in some way have it have it going on in the background because you kind of would want that wouldn't you mm-hmm. um and even if if it if it is actually if it's not Hayward's own if it if it's if it comes from a classical source I mean okay a modern day audience isn't probably gonna um yeah. necessarily know that but even so there's something that you could have some quite good fun if you could find a way to stage that I think in the background um Eric and then Francis uh Lynn was yeah. Oh, sorry, Lynn. Lynn, sorry, Lynn. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Eric. Um, I'm going to digress a little bit and and go back to my actor thing, um, because that um, that speech of Geraldine's is uh, is again such a great acting opportunity. What does this tell us about him mm. as a character? 
is he a little bit disapproving and embarrassed about it's just, oh they acted just like any you know there isn't anything in the narrative that reveals what his take on it is how he feels about it does he actually think it's that completely hilarious um uh, and oh yeah my young neighbor lionel because i think they're all neighbors um oh act in the wag again he's crazy <laughs> kid. Uh, and a watch came and it was all fine um or is he just like, oh, yeah, I'm really kind of embarrassed to be living near a person like this. And I disapprove of this really, really strong. So there's like so much an actor could do to play with that, to reveal like where he is in sort of the moral universe mm. of this play. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Um, Eric, then Francis. Yeah, I, I was going to go back to basically it's kind of like a bit of Stephen's point and a bit of other stuff. Um, basically, I, I was going to say how uh, I like the structure, how it starts with a sort of almost crowd scene. Um, and then you get like the sort of elaborate description of the shipwreck and stuff, as you know, Stephen said. Um, but it sort of peters off like, you know, it, it feels very modern in that way where you kind of have like the, the end of a party uh, and you've got sort of, you know, the last few hang not hangers on but people who are kind of it's like either their house or their friend's house and they're just hanging around with drinks you know chatting and kind of like just the last two people left at the party kind of thing which feels quite modern in a way <laughs> i don't know it's just I, I like that just kind of that they get their moment uh sort of because you know it's dalaville and uh, Prudentilla and geraldine and the wife and then it just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. So it's just the two of them, mm. uh, which is really kind of nice. Um, yeah. And my my other point was going to be that I like to think that when Geraldine is describing the sort of um, what do you call it, the shipwreck scene, that he's kind of en enacting it like sort of uh, oh yes, and they you know kind of climbed the main post and they did this and they did that in in his effort to be sort of a good storyteller, even though he says he's not. Yeah, I don't know. As Lynn said, it would depend on how you played him. It would depend on the sort of character that you. I, I, I don't know. I because I haven't read ahead. I, I, I don't know what kind of character he is. Whether his the character that he seems to have is what he's actually going to have, or whether it's all going to go pear shaped. But you could also have the clown, couldn't you, um, enacting it in the background if you didn't want um, him. That would be quite funny. Um, I think it was Francis uh, next. Yeah, I was just going to say, Sarah, I agree with you. Uh, I was thinking that um, during that great speech about the shipwreck amongst all the, the great speeches in this play, um, yeah, I was sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, be great if it could be going on in the background because it's such a great speech. Um, it's just a shame to, for it to go to waste like yeah. that. And I, I like Eric's idea of... Um, of a uh, young Geraldine um, uh, actually acting it out himself. But for me, he's too much of a kind of buttoned up character to do that, I think. Well, he is so far, isn't he? Well, yeah. I, I have a feeling he might become more unbuttoned as the play goes on, yeah. but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> we shall see. I have a feeling he might be getting his medallion out shortly but but but, yeah. but who, who knows sorry if you were born like after the 80s you won't get that reference but never mind um eric or on this side of the herring pond you know oh um, okay yeah <laughs> i was born after the anyway uh yeah no uh I, I like how yeah i was thinking that just as francis was speaking that like sort of if it's kind of Dalville and Prudent until they're going, oh yeah, you have to hear this. You have to hear what's happening. It's so funny. You should have been there. And then they give the speech to Geraldine, who's kind of this more serious person. So <laughs> it's kind of, I don't know. It's just interesting how this, this scene works. Just, yeah. 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 yeah, it really, really is. Right. Well, um, unless anyone has anything else to add about that scene, we'll move on to final thoughts. And I'm thinking people okay. will probably have quite a few final thoughts about this play because it's been, um, as we've said, um, multi-layered and kind of tasty. Um, Francis, let's start with you. Final <clears throat> thoughts, please. Well, it's such a rich play. I mean, the, I love the way it's written. I love the structure of it. Um, uh, it's also got something which I like in in all narratives, whether it's a play or a film or a TV show, where you've got two narrative threads and you're waiting for them to come together. And um, 
we have at this point we haven't reached the point where they really come together it started to happen but we still don't know where it's going and i think that makes the play very propulsive because you're you're just waiting to see okay where's this going and i still still don't know how to call it Mm. Uh, and i'm really sorry this is the only day i can do this week because Ah. um, so i think this is one time where i'm going to sort of uh, finish off reading Mm. uh, the play yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes when we get to the uh, end of a first session um, on, a, on a first look of a play and um, we still don't quite know where the plot's going, we're a bit like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. yeah. um, where is this? It's quite, as you say, it's quite the opposite. It's like, oh, well, we don't quite know where it's going yet, but oh, it's so tasty. And uh, I mean, that is absolutely a testament to... Um, to Hayward's uh, mm. writing and structure and characterization as well. Um, Alan, your final thoughts, please. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting, as has been said, it's very well structured, there's some well-written stuff in it. And I was just asking in the chat because Hayward, I think we did um, his Metallic plays, mm. uh, which was a series of four, which I found totally interminable. Mm-hmm. Um, and was losing the will to live throughout. <laughs> and yet, in this, he's proved he can actually write a good mm-hmm. storytelling play with some nice character flashes in it. Maybe, yeah. maybe because he wasn't shackled to rehacking his way through various versions of the Greek myths. Well, we have done other Hayward plays as well. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I, my mind has now gone blank, but... Um... Was the Fair Maid of the West him? Was that mm-hmm. Hayward? Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was the one, there was the tragedy as well about the wife. Yeah, the woman um, killed with kindness. The woman killed with kindness. So, I mean, yeah. And also, I I was, I missed, I gathered that the, um, the, the, um, the sort of Iron Age and Bronze Age and all, all the ages, I gathered the age plays were a bit interminable, but I was there for one. And I don't know if I just got lucky um, because and I missed all the tedious ones, but I found it quite, quite entertaining. But I can't remember which one it was. I have to say, um, but yeah, he's certainly he's certainly on his uh, metal here. Uh, Lynn, final thoughts from you, please. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back a little bit to the the exchange between Lionel and Scaffa. I mean, there was a lot being said about that, so that discussion was already getting a little long. But I, I kind of want to go back to it because again, what's going on is so complicated. I mean, maybe, yes, we're supposed to be mocking her. She's she's past her prime. Um, she's evidently an indulger and so overweight, which which was not as stigmatized then as it is now, I don't think. Um, um, and and Lionel's like, you're a buzzkill. You're, here's your walking papers. Um, but on the other hand, she is speaking truth, not to power because she doesn't realize he's there, but about power. Her daughter, and I think it's actually maybe literally her daughter, is going to be where she is now in 15, 20, maybe even just 10 years. So she's telling the truth. Uh, so so I, are we supposed to think she's funny or are we supposed to kind of get that wah, 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 or that sort of morality play vibe that, that um, Stephen was talking about that even though she's not an upright character she's telling her her daughter and her her daughter's lover telling them what's what's real she's keeping it real so I, yeah, that's just a complicated moment but really really interesting um i'm also for some reason well not it's it, it i think it should be clear to people who have read it it's uh, it reminds me of moments in the witch plays where the witch who is not an admirable character still tells the truth about mm. about society and it's and it's deep, deep cracks and its flaws. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, in, in many ways, Haywood is like always riffing on something else, morality plays, classical plays, witch plays, but he, the way he, he um, weaves that all together is, is really impressing me, is, has been quite skillful. And, you know, and usually I'm, I'm frustrated with a play that we've read a third of, and I don't know where to have it, I don't know where it is generically, um, you know, there was one play where we get to the end. And I'm like, oh, it's a romance. Okay, you could dramaturg this into 
into a quite successful performance piece because you signal to the audience in the beginning, it's a romance. Um, uh, so I'm usually uncomfortable when I don't know where to have it, but in this case, I think that's part of what makes it, it, it fascinating and compelling the way Francis, as Francis was saying, is you don't really know what's going on. How much tragedy, how much comedy, what is this? What is this mm. story? Yeah, it raises so many questions and they're questions that um, um, Eric put in the chat earlier. I think Sarah's hungry today because I keep yeah, using the word tasty. But for me, it's like putting my, di my director's head on. These are the questions that make me salivate because these are the questions that you want to find a way to answer um, in a when you're directing a, a, a production. And, um, you know, when there's more than one answer, that just makes it even more tasty. Um, Aliki, final thoughts, please. So I'm really interested in these two households and in how mm. you would stage them, uh, just physically how they occupy the space where they're so unaware of each other, apparently. Um, and when we started, I thought we were going to have the good household contrasted to the bad household. But as we go on, it looks as if the, the good household is perhaps only the hypocritical household. Mm. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, I also want to speak up a little bit for uh, Haywood's uh, metal plays, much maligned here recently. I thought the Trojan War one, the two uh, Iron Age plays, was brilliant and yes. one of the reasons it was brilliant was it kept showing you people who kept telling you how virtuous and just and right they were and showing you how wrong they were and how vicious they were yeah and yeah. that's kind of what's intrigued me about this mm -hmm. and all of the kindness there not that there isn't you know lots of good rich material with many characters but it's that question of of who is being moral that i'm interested in yeah, it was the it was the iron it was that was the Iron Age play, was it the Trojan yeah. World? That was the one I was there for, and it yeah, it was it was really very very compelling. As indeed is this so far, uh, Eric. Final thoughts from you, please. Um, yeah, I find this interesting because like I was thinking, I was trying to think of something to focus on since we've talked about play so much, um, and I, I came to the conclusion that what's interesting is the female characters in this play. They kind of have this. Um, you don't usually get like sort of. I don't know, silver-tongued prostitutes for fun of, uh, or sort of, um, or sex workers who can actually like voice their thoughts. Usually it's kind of like, I don't know, sort of, um, you get characters like Jane Shore, who is a good woman, but falls because of societal pressure. Uh, or you get the other extreme where you have like sort of, um, like characters who are intent on doing what they're doing. Whereas, as all the sort of, um, at least I think so, I can't, I can't really think of very many plays, uh, yeah, um, where it's not one or the other. Um, and here you have like more complex characters, which is kind of interesting. And uh, you have a range of them as well. You have like status as well, sort of like the wife, uh, presumably married into status, or even, you know, this is me filling background stuff or not, I don't know. Um, whereas Scaffa and Blanda are kind of more like, this is how we survive. <laughs> what are we going to do without, um, you know, this outside of the situation? Whereas Prudentilla and um, the wife, who is unfortunately unnamed, um, are kind of, well, not necessarily noble women, but, or, you know, gentle women, or, but they're just definitely like, you know, in charge of their household, that kind of mm. thing. I don't know. It's just interesting how you get the, the discrepancy sort of yeah we haven't actually talked much either about the character of the wife um at all and, and which is i think probably only because um there are so many other interesting characters to talk about because she's actually a very she's a you know she's had some very interesting things to say herself and there's a uh, a picture of her developing in my mind at least um of quite a complex um woman so yeah be interesting to see where that goes, if indeed it goes anywhere. Um, Stephen, your final thoughts, please. Um, well, I mean, like everybody else, I I, I, I like it. Um, I, I have to say that virtually everything critical people have been saying has just been wonderful. So um, I've really, really enjoyed listening to everybody talking about it too. Um, 
I was thinking about that, that wonderful word that Francis used, propulsive, which I'm going to nick, I think is, it is great. Uh, I, think, I think one of the reasons is I, we've, got, we've got about four things going on, haven't we? Already, like we're about, I don't know how many scenes in we are. Officially. Only three. We've only done three. three okay, scenes. so we've, yes. we've, we've got some things. We're just, we're in the beginning and there's no messing about, you know, there's no what's my motivation, what's the steward's motivation, mm, you know. And there, there isn't really that much with, with the kind of, the main kind of love couple either. It's just taken for granted that they've got this thing for each other and and that's where we start. And um uh, I think the interesting thing about it is it feels like a, it feels like something which is both a play of ideas and a play of, of character. That you know we aren't just about what is happening to people, because the the amazing stuff that people say is also really interesting. Mm. You know, and and um, like uh, I can't remember who it was. Maybe Lynn was saying about about Scaffy, You know the. The, the two do the two do blend where you you have a somebody who has a, a character role but who's saying some incredibly interesting stuff about uh, about society too and I think that's one of the sources of um, of its power is that mm. it's it's so damn interesting even not on a character level and part of that is fireworks and part of that is you know a, a, a brilliantly written clown part I think. Mm. And I have a horrible feeling that the clown is, you know, as is often the case, that that's it for the clown, you know, which is kind of because <laughs> it'll unbalance everything else. But but so far, you know, that that's been great, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, and so that that kind of sense of not just, um, you know, it, it's a it's a really mature dramatist, you know, is this kind of bit in the beginning, the preface before the preface where he's saying, yeah, two hundred twenty plays, can't remember how many, you know, just yeah. this is just the improv king. You know, mm. uh, and he's he's just kind of running through some of these routines that he's been playing in Chicago for the last forty years, and boy, can he do them now! You know, and I really like that. So I I, I think it's um it, it's beautifully set up at this point. It's great to be leaving at this. But I don't I don't really know what happens. I I suspect it might get less interesting as it gets more dramatically powerful. Possibly, don't know. Um, Because I don't know, in the sense that, you know, these some of these ideas, you know, about hospitality, about carnival or whatever, they're there now. They're not developable ideas, in a sense. That's it now. You know, Mm. we're going to we're going to need to have something else to take us through because it isn't a morality play. Actually, it's uh, again, can't remember who said it, but somebody said riffing on it, you know, and that's why it's such an incredibly rich opening, I think. But I think we are going to have to drop some of those elements we so. shall see we shall see if we have to lower our expectations as the play got that's never happened before um <laughs> lois just to wrap up quickly your final thoughts please uh lois um, has frozen we have lost lois ah okay we won't we'll, we'll have we'll have lois's uh final thoughts tomorrow then um we'll start with her tomorrow um in which case it's time for me now to hand over to final final thoughts uh to rob so um thanks for coming back rob and um i shall say adieu good cheese and onions to everyone and sign off uh yes well we'll just see if uh, lois comes back but uh it's it's uh looks like uh well it's a shame that at that final moment uh, we lost lois but uh uh, at, at least we 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 got the uh, the majority of the session, so you never know might come back. Um, yeah, it's been um, it's been enjoyable. I've I've only been able to catch bits and bobs, but um, the bits and bobs are very good. I mean, uh, Howard has written a lot of plays by this point, and uh, yeah, does doesn't he seem to be having fun? Um, there's a lot more fun to be had next time. I know where this is going. Um... <laughs> Nobody else does. Uh, so, yes, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how the room uh, takes uh, where the narrative is going. Uh, so, oh, is Lois back? Is Lois oh, back? Hello. Lois, <laughs> final thoughts. Okay, yeah, I just said the most brilliant thing anyone's ever said about Haywood, but unfortunately it was all silence, so you haven't heard it. No, certainly uh, not. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very keen on Haywood. You know, as I, I think I've said before that because he was an actor, he wrote really good parts for actors. And it's always a, a pleasure reading him. And I, I admire people that have the sort of staying power he had. I mean, that bit in the preface about uh, this tragic comedy being one reserved among 220 in which I have had either an entire hand or at least a main finger. Is that where that comes from? Okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. And... Uh, uh, and the way that it combines so many different elements, uh, you know, I liked uh, I liked Edward the Fourth. I liked uh, I actually quite like the Aegis plays. I I like the way that I think he was actually trying to, to show something in them about sexual mores in in the uh, the, the the world of myth and uh, without commenting on it. But I think he probably thought it was as disgusting as we thought some of those bits. And uh, this reminds me a bit of the opening of uh, Woman Killed with Kindness, where you get this couple who've just got married and then somebody's saying you know how um oh god have you all no you haven't frozen good yeah, um someone's saying you. you're so well matched everything is great you know and uh, what you know it's again that what can possibly go wrong thing that's uh, that's set up at the beginning and uh uh yeah the, and the way that it, it develops i mean i am going to be quite interested to see whether we can make anything of the connection between the two plots um uh, but uh, yeah, I, I like it. I, I, hey, Haywood is also very moral. I mean, that's the thing that kind of disappoints you sometimes about him and moral in a kind of conventional 16th, early 17th century way. Uh, so sometimes you, you're you hoping that he will turn out to be more um, progressive or something, and he usually isn't. Mm. So we shall see where that will land us next time. Uh, so all that remains is to thank Sarah for covering for me and all the wonderful readers for all their wonderful reading. Thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. A Massacre of Meat.